and we've become less reactive in the way we work in the business. It's, it's, I think it goes down to really asking ourselves, is that the right thing to do right now? Why are we doing it? Does it align with the vision? What are our core values? It, it has actually also helped us make some like really important decisions. Business of Architecture, episode 267. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. Today, I bring you a case study of how two firm owners are forging the business of their dreams by working on their business, not just in their business. Today's podcast episode is sponsored by Gusto and Sage Glass. Gusto is an outsourced HR service that gives you big firm firepower while simplifying paying your employees and contractors and filing your taxes. Payroll and HR management can consume a lot of time in the firm, especially for small firms. And Gusto takes this burden off of you and your team so you can focus on giving good service and creating great architecture. Give it a try and get three free months by going to gusto.com forward slash B-O-A. Sage Glass is the manufacturer of intelligent, reliable dynamic glass. By intelligent, I mean it tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat while still maintaining unobstructed views of the outdoors. Pretty cool stuff. Visit sageglass.com to discover more and see how Sage Glass can help you amaze your next client. Today, I have a special interview with two firm leaders from Johannesburg, South Africa. They are the founders of 2610 South Architects based in Johannesburg. They have a staff of about 10 people inclusive, and these two architects have implemented a lot of the strategies that they learned with me and Scott in the architecture firm Freedom Formula program, which focuses on setting up a, uh, an efficient business system in your practice. Uh, they do incredible work. I'm very happy to have them on the line today to talk about their, their experience, about some of the changes they've made in their business to feel more liberated and actually a big strategic breakthrough that they're going to tell us in, in terms of where they're going to take their firm in the future. So, Anna and Thorsten, welcome. Thank you. And you guys are based in Johannesburg. Yes. So tell me what kind of, what kind of challenges are you facing right now and even before you joined the program with a practice in South Africa? What is that like? I think architecture, you can describe it as a somewhat marginalized profession that's probably true globally in the sense that architects will always address the top 1%, 2% of the population. And as a practice, we've always wanted to work at a broader base. And so it has been tricky to find, um, to build a bit successful, lucrative business around that. And we tended to, from the beginning, uh, diversify in order to gather many projects in our field of interest, which is more socially aligned architecture, urban design and infrastructure. And I think we've come to the realization now that we need to focus on one thing and to structure our business as a product around that one thing that we do and that we do well, and that is now to become a business developer architect business. All right. So we'll yep. talk more about that. Now, you guys have been in the Freedom Formula program that I run with Scott Beebe for over a little bit over six months now. What was happening in your business that made you want to join up in the program? Um, I think what happens with a lot of architects, we study at universities and we go there because we have an affinity to design. Um, but I think a lot of... Um, architectural education is missing the aspect of how to run a business. So I think what naturally happens, you start a business and you learn by trial and error and you make many mistakes because you just don't know how to run a business. So I think what, what has happened in our firm, we have, we have always sort of um, tried to come up with a vision every year when people return from the, from the long holiday and then in the staff reviews, we came up with action items. But I think um, what has really helped us is to also be guided to, towards um, business books. I think especially I, I would say that has really helped me. There's been an amazing 
literature and to actually really realize that some mistakes are not necessary if you would know better of how to run processes or if you would understand interlinked systems better and how that all affects everything. And so uh, to, 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 I think the essence is, is that we, we have started to really work in the business now and on the business. And we've become less reactive in the way we work in the business. It's, it's, I think it goes down to really asking ourselves, is that the right thing to do right now? Why are we doing it? Does it align with the vision? Um, what are our core values? It, it has actually also helped us make some like really important decisions. What you mentioned books and what are some of the books that you found to be really useful for you in this journey? Um, I think the, the first one is definitely the E-Myth. I think it applies to everybody who, who has um, started a business or thinks of starting a business should read it. Um, I think um, one comes to a point in one's life where one actually has the idea to run a business, but you, you go in quite blind. And I think if one, one would have read that before, you could avoid many mistakes. I think the second book I would recommend is um, the, the 12 year, 12 week year, um, which also helps focus on sort of shorter periods of time where certain actions should be taken. Um, I think The Power of Moments is also a very good book to read. Um, and then I think Multipliers as well. That's, hmm? that's what my mum, that's actually one my mum recommended, funny enough. <clears throat> I think on, that's by Susan Wiseman, is that right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. fantastic yeah. book on leadership. Good, and it talks about how to really get a team culture to where people are uh, acting in, in their best and highest use and so multiplying the effort that happens in the business. So yeah. when you guys talked about, as all of us architects discover, we, we become architects because we love design. And there's an amazing feeling seeing a design come to pass, seeing that that building's done. I mean, I've experienced that amazing thrill. Um, but then sometimes it seems like there's so much happening in the business with invoicing, with trying to make a sale, trying to sell clients, trying to find new clients, that it changes the dynamic of what it's like once you become a firm owner. So what I'd like to know from you is, what were the specific things, if you think back, you know, 12 months ago, uh, what were the specific things in the business that you found were just not working for you and that were just frustrating you? Um, I think our Monday team meetings were mm -hmm. most frustrating. Um, and I think through the um, through the architectural freedom formula, we basically are managing to run our team meetings in a in a very concentrated and focused way, um, where we always bring in core values, big wins, and it's actually fun. And the other thing is, previously as business owners, we would sit on a weekends and actually have to think about okay what are all the things we need to discuss in team meetings and through having a format actually any staff member um, of our team can run the team meetings and that's actually a very empowering tool to have received through this program for me there was the lack of a clearly articulated and written down vision and values that we felt them and we lived them, I think, as business owners, but we never communicated them in so many words to, in clear words to our team. And we found as soon as we did that, people responded to it incredibly positive and used it in their daily work. Um, so that was fantastic to see the kind of level of ownership that people take over the work and that you can, in a way, um, handle many of the decisions through looking at uh, the mission and the values. And it also so, helped a lot with clients. Okay. So there's probably a fair number of firms listening to this that have a vision or they have a mission. If you said it might be in their head, it might be on paper. 
But what happens so often, of course, is that vision gets put in a binder somewhere. Mm. It never gets open. It never gets reviewed again. So how have you guys done it differently so that this concept, this kind of theoretical principle, this tactic has actually had a massive impact because you feel like it has, you know, how have you implemented that to actually have that effect in your business? So the first way is through the team meetings and the agenda that we do. And then we also get different team members to run the meetings. And so that's the first thing we go through on every Monday. And then the, the highs and lows, we try to articulate them in terms of those values. Then secondly, um, we put them in our proposals to, to clients for projects. Um, and we also write about them through you know, publicity we put out. And we found that naturally then people kind of latch onto those. And we've, we've seen uh, our staff run site meetings where they go through the, the values in order to get everybody on the same page. So that's been really wonderful to see and incredibly empowering for the staff and also taking a big kind of pressure and load of us to constantly want to manage things. And instead, if we articulate what we want to achieve, then that happens more easily. So that's been really the fun. All of it's been incredibly a lot of fun and rewarding to see people rise to and ourselves rise to the values that we unpack. I would say that that was one of the biggest uh, achievements for myself as a business owner. And then to trust, and I say simply, the values are really simple. They're very easy to understand. And so they get taken up very easily by people we work with. And do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think it's it's also about the business actually being a team effort. It doesn't all hinge on our shoulders anymore. It doesn't feel like that. Um, what we've also implemented, we because we have um, the webinar sessions on Thursday, so we have implemented a, a pre-chat session with our staff where we actually say, okay, what are our big wins that we want to share? Um, and then we've also implemented post-chat sessions is where we reflect on the webinar sessions. And it's, it's really interesting to see what different aspects um, different staff members pick up on. So again, it's like a, it goes into depth, okay, why are we doing this? And then ideas come out and sometimes action items that should be put on the Monday meeting uh, agenda and also Sometimes it's even about, well, who could do that? Who wants to do that? And it's amazing actually to see that a lot of things that we thought we as business owners had to do all by ourselves is not necessary um, us having to do it. Like people are quite willing to, to help to shape and make a business work and they actually take pride in being able to contribute. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you've been able to get the staff engaged. Uh, you've been able to help them focus on the reason why. That's very interesting. So the coaching call that, that you're referring to, of course, is, you know, Scott Beebe and I, we run a, a coaching call for the program every Thursday. It's a group coaching call where all the current members of the program get on. I find that's fascinating. That's cool that we'll have to share this with the other members in the group that you guys have a pre-session where you brainstorm your big wins from the past week. And then you have a debrief session at the end where you go and ask the staff, what insights did they have? Are there things here we need to implement? Mm. Mm. That's, that's amazing. Wow. Was there, so you mentioned that before the program, the meetings were frustrating that you were having with the staff. You know, why exactly did you feel that those meetings were so frustrating? I think the, <clears throat> the content wise, they haven't changed that much in terms of, there's a number of projects and a number of things you have to do to address on that project, but we've managed to um, focus on only what's necessary for that week. We've structured the agenda very clearly, and we've said we're not go going to take longer than an hour. So we're always very 
everyone's very happy when this thing is over in an hour, but everyone I think looks forward to, to you know, inputting into it. And also on, we have them on Mondays and on Fridays, we ask everyone to update the agenda or at least the action items. So we've made a kind of spreadsheet with the accountability like initial so you, people can filter according to their initials and see exactly their items. What also really helps was to put the yes items, so the action items that have been achieved up front and go through those briefly. And it gives a sense of achievement. So I think that the structure and predictability are things that have really allowed us to thrive. Got it. And when you say thrive, what does that mean to you? How, how have you thrived? Um, I think looking forward to going to work, to doing the, the meetings, to spending time in the team, working, you know, pursuing very clear goals that are framed by uh, the vision and the values. And it feels like we're going in a good direction. Was there anything else in the business besides the meetings before that you were running up against that felt like a plateau or felt frustrating to you as business owners? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would, I would say uh, thinking that the business owned us, you know, that we just, the machine, it felt like we were in a hamster wheel, um, which sometimes we still are but it shifts our perspective into saying, well, um, we can work on the business rather than just subservient to it. And to make that happen, we need to delegate, uh, delegate tasks uh, to people who can do them and also to attract and train people to be able to execute them. So you, yeah. like I said, you've been in the program, you've been some of our most uh, implementing members in terms of implementing things. Very impressive how you've involved your staff. So you've actually been one of the firms that have had your staff on the calls so they could yes. actually get the same business education, which is just incredible. How many, how many staff did you have before the program? Um, I think we always were on about, uh, all together, uh, we were between seven and ten people. So that hasn't changed much. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so you're about the same size right now. And looking back at everything you've implemented, what have been your biggest wins? You did mention um, the mindset shift of working on the business, not think, thinking like the business owns you. You talked about uh, the team meetings and actually empowering your staff so that they take more responsibility in the business. What other wins do you feel that you've experienced from implementing the things uh, that you've learned? Um, I think there's a very important thing that um, one comes to a point where one almost feels you are re-explaining the same things again and again and again. Um, so what we've started to do is to write processes. Um, we've really looked at our business and said, okay, these are admin tasks that are repeat, um, repeat work in a way. Then in production, obviously in architecture, we go through certain stages in the project like sketch design, council submission, and so on. And there's certain steps you have to follow according to a certain standard. So, um, through business of architecture, we've identified what are the tasks that we keep on repeating and that we have to re-explain to staff members. And we've started writing these processes. Um, yeah, we're busy with that. So our big aim for the end of the year is to actually have written the major processes down so we do not need to explain them anymore. And that the standard is set exactly as how we want it done. And how is that affecting the business and how do you think it will affect the business? Um, I think it will liberate us and our senior staff from a lot of the training they do on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and writing the processes, we've even got junior staff, you know, writing simple processes. So it engenders a bigger sense of ownership and kind of also you 
building a kind of legacy and system to which you contribute then and to fulfill the um, mission and values so that so always having those mission values makes sense why you're writing a process in order to achieve that so it's very easy to reference to this is what we want to do and this is why we do it so it feels like we are kind of in the in the sort of upward trajectory and we feel less i think stressed about the business got it and you you talked about liberating the senior staff liberating yourself it's had that effect what effect will that have on the business having your senior staff and yourselves be more liberated in the business i think we can we can pursue the kind of work we really want to do um so build out that business idea we discussed in the beginning and also i think become more mentors who benefit from you know one and a half decades of experience and, and so we see ourselves more as mentors to uh, junior staff in helping them execute their their projects um and they have also have the processes to to kind of mine in order to do the work so i think our input is much more targeted it's much more uh beneficial to the staff member and to us to not wasting time mm-hmm. asking people you know retraining people on the same thing how do you do a council submission drawing you know what should be in the window and door schedule how do you format something for a two page or media release that's written you can point to where not even where it is in the chart but where the chart is now you guys you guys run a very design focused firm it's very focused on uh, not only architecture space but also the theoretical implications of what space means what architecture is and you mentioned that this process has caused you to have a, a big insight, a strategic kind of focus, and maybe a, a pivot in your business. You mentioned the new business venture that you guys are conceptualizing. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Where do you see this going? What was that insight you had, and how do you want to implement that in the future? Um, I think what we've realized that architects are service providers, um, and we work incredibly hard um, to yeah to make a living and we work incredibly hard because we aspire to do beautiful things that are meaningful and that are impactful on a social level and but we've also come to the conclusion that a lot of the work we do we do for other people who then get um freedom freedom of time through for example having a property investment portfolio and as a matter of fact we've also realized that we are often that decisions on design get made by people who might at times um, take out things that are really important to us. So the thinking or the shift has happened where we said if we were our own clients, we would actually be able to um, build amazing products exactly in the way that we think they are beneficial to cities. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, transition transitioning into like property development and being our own clients. And I think where we see the opportunity is in refining like two or three products and to write the business processes around how those products are established, how the opportunities are established. Um, and to in the end have the architecture part. So in the past, each project was unique which we want, we're really hoping to refine a set of buildings that can be repeated with minor variations, but that adds up to making a good neighborhood. And there's a great opportunity in Johannesburg because the old suburbs around the core are still all um, one-story residential, but the need for accommodation is just astronomical. So these suburbs are, in a sense, being rebuilt to over four floors and we would like to take part in that not as a, a a kind of service provider but as a player and that that we can align our design process with the development of each project so the design decisions are tied very much into the economics and the end users 
how do you guys feel about this new opportunity that you've identified? Um, extreme, excited. Yeah, <laughs> extremely excited. Yeah. Yeah. It seems achievable. Hmm. It seems achievable because um, we know why we're doing it and what we need to do in terms of setting up systems that will allow us to do what we want to do. So it sounds like in addition, this focusing on the business has given both of you a lot more confidence about thinking, like you said, about your business as a product and seeing what value you can bring to the market. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys might, if you haven't already, check out the interview I did with John Warasilla on the Business what? of Architecture podcast. Yeah. I can send you that link. Did you hear that one already, Anne? Yes, I did. Okay, I, good. It, it sort of, um, I thought that it was so nice to listen to it, yes. Good. That's exactly so, where we're going, and it was nice to hear how they actually had to learn everything from scratch um, and become experts. Yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't mind connecting with you guys if you want an introduction. But Thorsten, in case you haven't heard that, they went down a similar path about uh, almost 15 years ago of deciding they wanted to get into development uh, for the same reasons you guys are wanting to do that as well. And he talks about the journey of doing that, how now they own a number of multifamily buildings in downtown Durham, North Carolina. So you guys can definitely do it. You guys have the skills. You guys have the knowledge. You have the drive, the team. So, and you're in a great location in the world where it feels like right now South Africa is being more of a big player, both regionally and nationally. So that's, sounds like an exciting place to be at. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anne and Thorsten. Any, any last thoughts about this process that you just want to share, things that were powerful for you or things that you'd like to tell other architects? Um, yeah, what, I mean, the, the uh, business of architecture, it's quite a commitment to make um, every Thursday evening. But I think what was really exciting for us to, um, to be able to share our challenges and wins with other architects around the world and to actually realize the struggles we are going through, others are also going through. And there were some really great um, moments where somebody in Australia would give advice on how they managed to overcome a certain challenge or somebody in the States. So it was really great to connect with people globally who are in the same boat in a way. And it, it um, makes it, one thinks it's more achievable because you realize you're not the only one struggling and it makes so much sense to then go ahead. And it was also quite, um, inspiring to see how others went about certain challenges. There was a lot of advice and goodwill and sharing, and I think that was worth it, absolutely. Yeah, I concur with Anna. Um, to me also, those calls uh, are incredibly valuable, even if you only listen in for an hour, but you can see how different people approach the same issue in a unique way and how actually how simple it is and how much it is simply about implementation. That's a, a thing as a kind of perfectionist I had to learn and I'm still learning is to um, prioritize implementation over complete perfection. And that's kind of liberating too. That's powerful. So it's good to do things well, but it's better to get them done. Yeah. yeah. I guess if they don't get done, then there's zero results. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anna and Thorsten, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. So if, if you're an architect, designer, landscape architect who's listening, either listening or watching this interview with this uh, amazing firm from South Africa, and you'd like to know how you can hear more about this program and make some of these changes in your business, you can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. That's one word, no spaces, freedom webinar. On that 60 minute training webinar, you'll discover how firms just like yours have built a firm of lasting value and freedom and the steps that you can take to be able to do the same. Today's episode is sponsored by Gusto and Sage Glass. So I want to thank them for supporting the show. Gusto is an outsourced HR service that gives you big firm firepower while simplifying paying your employees and contractors and 
filing your taxes. Payroll and HR management can really consume a lot of time uh, in the firm, and Gusto takes this burden off of you so you can focus on giving good service and creating great architecture. Give it a try and get three months for free by going to gusto.com forward slash BOA. Sage Glass is the manufacturer of intelligent, reliable dynamic glass. By intelligent, I mean it tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat while still maintaining a view to the outdoors without having to mess with curtains or blinds. Visit sageglass.com to discover more and see how Sage Glass can help you amaze your next client. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.